So I, I bet at least one time you've found yourself, if you've been coming to Valley View here with, since I've been here, looking at me saying, why are you doing what you do? I mean, why aren't you doing something like cleaning ceilings or trimming trees? I mean, I don't understand why you'd be a minister. I know you've asked the question because I ask the question myself all the time. Why are you even doing this? No, I, I'm, I want to share with you guys a moment about why it is that I do what I do, why it is that uh, I'm doing what it is that God has called me to do here. Back in 2000, I was a youth minister intern at a church in Clovis, and um, I was, you know, going to be a senior in college. I was working with their young people, uh, working with the students there, and I was having a great time getting to serve and getting to make a difference and watch these kids grow. Um, we didn't actually have anybody else on staff there full time, so I was kind of working by myself with the kids and with some adults too and everything like that. And it was, it was a lot of fun. I was playing games with them. We go play baseball all the time and have a good time. It was really great. I loved what I was doing. And then one day, it got real. Um, it, these things happened, and one day it really did. Um, it was a rough group of kids. We had kids from broken homes, kids from all kinds of different backgrounds, kids who had all kinds of different struggles. And uh, one kid started coming to the youth group about halfway through. He was 18. He was going to be a senior in high school. And he was about 6'4". Um, he, and this is that time, that window of time, when uh, a lot of the, the kids who you know, were having some struggles, they were like... Um, you know, dog collars on their wrists and all that stuff. You know, I'm talking about the spikes on the wrists and all that thing. And, he, and that, this kid was wearing that stuff. I was investing a lot of time and energy into this kid. I worked with him a lot. We had uh, some really good conversations. And one day, uh, it all kind of fell apart. We had a youth group event just before I, I left there. It was towards the end of July. And I took the kids all out to a park in Clovis there, and we played games and had a good time, captured the flag and all that stuff. And when we got back home to the church. I, I unloaded the church van, and I can still see this scene vividly in my mind. Um, I was turning to the church van, and when I turned back towards the church, I saw this kid pick up a 12-year-old by the neck, hold him in the air like this, and then slam him to the ground and start choking him. It was crazy, right? It went from uh, we're having a good time to what is going on. And so I, I went running towards this kid. I took off and I'm thinking to myself, you know, that, that moment you realize, I guess this is going to happen. I, I'm thinking I got to tackle him and get him off. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in a fight here. This is what's going to go down. And, and so I ran at him and I'm yelling, what are you doing? What are you doing? And he let go and he looked up at me, at me and he got in my face and he took his fist back like he was going to punch me. And I was good with that. I was good with that because it was better him punching me than this little kid on the ground. And, and when I looked at his face, there was a darkness there that is unexplainable. I could tell you about it, but it wouldn't make any sense unless you saw it. There was a darkness in his eyes. There was, there was an anger in his eyes, but there was also this fear, right? There was this fear in him that was tangible. And he looked at me, and, and, and I said, what are you doing? And he said, you don't love me. Nobody loves me. And I, I said, can't you see what we're doing for you? And he took off, and he sprinted, and he ran off into the park, and he ran away. Um, now, he hadn't made the wisest of decisions. The kid that he was choking was like a detective on the police force son, so that didn't work out well for him. Um, they, they went hunting for him. They found him. He ended up going to jail. It was really, really rough. I realized in that moment that God needs us to work with people because this world is broken. But I also realized something else as I looked at him, and I looked in his face, I realized that there was something going on inside him that was much more than just a mental struggle. There was an attack happening. And I'm not, I'm not going to stand up here today and, and rationalize away what we're going to see in the Word. This morning we're going to dig into the Bible and we're going to actually see an attack like this. We're going to see a spiritual attack, but we're also going to see how God can deliver us from these things. What I want to ask you guys to do is turn uh, to Acts chapter 19. It's a very intense passage in, this, in, in, in the Bible here as we're going through the scriptures. We're in this passage talking about to the ends of the earth, and, and uh, the last uh, two weeks ago, Brandon got up and he talked about Acts 17 and Paul going to Athens and, and sharing the gospel uh, with people who were very, very, very far from God. And some of them coming to believe. After that, he ended up in Ephesus. And Ephesus was a place where he was able to really get to share the truth. And he was able to really get to dig in. In that time, we may see what is maybe the most successful ministry for Paul in his entire time uh, following Jesus. Got to the place where it says that this is what's happening. If you look at um, verse 11 and 12. 
of Acts chapter 19, it said, And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. It says that God was doing extraordinary miracles through Paul. Now, I don't know what an ordinary miracle is, um, but these are extraordinary, right? This is, this is beyond anything that anybody expected to see. Obviously, it was an amazing thing. So people were seeing God do these amazing things through Paul. They were seeing evil spirits taken out of people. They were seeing uh, people healed and physically healed. And, and, and what happened there, and this is going to set the scene for where we are, is when, when people started to see that something was different about Paul and the Christians, they wanted what was happening there. They didn't actually want to follow Jesus as much as they wanted that same type of power that Paul seemed to have. They wanted it for notoriety. They wanted it for attention. They wanted it for financial gain. And so they decided maybe we can take advantage of this and get something for ourselves. So we're going to look at verse 13 through 16 of Acts chapter 19 today. It's pretty intense. So let's dig in. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by, the, by Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish, priest, Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I've heard of Paul, or Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. So these guys, as we set the scene here, as we start to understand, uh, these, these guys thought it would be a great idea to, to use the name of Jesus for their own ad advantage, for their own gain. And so they, they went and they found a guy that everybody said, that guy's possessed, there's something wrong with that guy. And, and these brothers, the seven sons of the Jewish high priest, uh, decided we're going to go cast out a demon. We're going to get this. It's going to be attention for us. Just like Paul's getting, it's going to be wonderful. We're going to do that. And so they walk into this room, and they see this guy, and, and they walk up to him. Brothers, walk up to this guy, and they say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, come out of this man. Cool. Great. Everything's awesome. We get to do this. We get to see some cool stuff happen. It's going to be great. People are going to love us. And then things got real. You ever had that moment when you realize this has just gotten tense? The possessed man looks at them and he says, and I can only imagine what his voice sounded like, I know Jesus, and I've heard of Paul, but I don't know you. And then he stands up. He comes at these guys, and I don't even know how this went down. Takes all seven of them, beats them and strips them naked, and then you see them sprinting down the road naked, in fear, afraid. That's crazy talk, right? I mean, there's some pretty big dudes in this room. We got some, we got some big guys in this room. I don't think one of you is probably going to hold seven of us, seven brothers, right? They're, they're, one of you isn't going to make seven of us strip us naked, take us out of the room, you know, beat us. That, that's an impressive thing. I would have thought somebody could have got out. This guy, by the power of the evil that was in him, overpowered these seven guys, beat them up, and they went running down the road naked. Now, you can imagine those guys running down the road naked and going, ah, it's kind of a funny thing when you think about it, until you realize how crazy intense this had to be. How does that happen? How does that happen? This morning, we need to have an honest, honest conversation, guys. We do. You see, these guys, these seven brothers, they decided to use Jesus in the name of Jesus, for their own notoriety, for their own well-being, for their own good. Not because they wanted to follow him, but because it was good for them. And then, in that moment, things got real. Up until that moment, you see, they were playing games. And we do that. We play games with God. We play games with evil. We mess around with God, and, and we think that we can get away with things. We, we think that we can use God for our own well-being. We, we think that we can put on a face, and, and it's going to be great for us. And please, understand, I know I'm tall, and I know I'm standing above you, but I'm not above you in this. 
When I read this story and I read about these brothers, I can see myself thinking that, well, as long as I just say the right things and I do the right things, things are going to be okay. Things are fine. It's not a big deal. And it was in that moment when they realized this is really dark, evil, broken stuff that we're facing. This is bigger than us. How many of us, if we're honest, can find ourselves saying, it's not a big deal. And so we play these games. And we take advantage. We get into dark things that we should never be into. And we think it's okay. Until all of a sudden it's not. Until the evil actually shows up. So let me, see, let me show you guys what happened here after that. It's a, it's a powerful thing that God did. Verse 17 through 20. And this became known to all of the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled or lifted up. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and they burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and they found that it had been 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. We have two groups of people here in verse 17 that I want to notice. When, when, when the word got out, and you can, you can see how this would happen, when word got out, what had happened, this is a smallish town, it's small enough that people would know, when word got out that these seven brothers were, were running down the road naked and bleeding because the demon had said, I know who Jesus is, but I don't know you. James tells us that that's a reality, that even demons believe in Jesus and they shudder at his name. When the word got out, the people in the community who didn't know Jesus or had heard a little bit about him, when they, they heard about what happened, they were afraid. And you can get it, right? I mean, this scares me. They were afraid. They were afraid and they said, you know what? We're good. We're, we're going to put away our stuff. Those people I understand. But here's the part that I want to talk about this morning because I think it's, it's pretty intense when we realize it. There's also, it says in verse 17, Verse 18. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and they burned them in the sight of all. Here, to me, is, is the, the hard part. You see, there were plenty of people in Ephesus that were coming to Jesus. The church was growing quickly. It was, a, it was powerful in, the, in the, the work that God was doing. People were confessing Jesus. They were, they were saying that they were followers of Jesus. The church was, like I said, it was growing. But at this very moment, when they heard about what happened, people in the church came forward and they said, you know what? I've got some secrets that I've been hiding. I've got some secrets. I've got this, this, this stuff, this, this sorcerer's book that I've been holding on to. I've got this stuff that I know that, that Jesus says I don't need anymore, but, but I've been holding on to it because it just, well, it felt good, and I liked it, and it worked, and it was, it, 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 well, it kind of worked, and I thought it was good, and I, I didn't want to let it go yet. And, and so the, the church poured out and started to confess their own brokenness at the face of what, going, of what, what had happened. You see, the church then is not a lot different than the church today. Again, I'm not speaking over you guys. I'm I'm speaking truth. I've, I've shared before, the best thing that could happen for all of us in this room is if all of my brokenness and sin were just shown on this screen so you guys could look at me and say, Jim, you're, you're junk. Because then we could have an honest conversation because you'd look and say, and I got a lot of the same stuff. Most of the time, though, we show up at church on Sunday morning and we, we're, we're arguing all the way to church and yelling at each other about the fact that you're late and then I don't even want to go and I don't even know why we're doing this. And then we hit the parking lot and then all of a sudden it's like, everybody shut up and smile, kids. It's time to do this. <laughs> right? And we act like it's not a big deal. But we're hiding. Like the church then, we're hiding. And so we keep these things and we hide these things and it's only when we really encounter the true power of God, of God and the darkness that is in this world that we are, start to understand, I've got to let this go. Verse 19 and 20, 
And the number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and they burned them in the sight of all and they counted the value of them and they found that it was 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. What must it have been like in Ephesus as the people, Christians and not Christians, as the people came and they walked out of their house and they were carrying something that everybody else would know what it was and say, oh wow, she's got that? Or oh wow, he still does that? And they walked up and they put it in the middle and they burned it up. Why would they do that? Two reasons. When we truly encounter the power of God, we quickly come to understand how broken we are. When we become people who brag about ourselves, it's usually a pretty good sign that we don't necessarily realize how great God is and how broken we are in ourselves. When we find ourselves calling out other people in the face of our own righteousness, it's because we don't understand. When we come to understand the power of God, though, in the way that these guys did, when we, came, when we come to understand that power, it makes it very easy for us to understand, I don't have it, and I don't want it. I don't want this anymore. I want him. And so people brought their stuff. But the second reason, and this is the coolest reason of the entire thing when you look at this passage here, the second reason that they all brought their stuff together and they put it here is in the context of what we see. There are three stories in this passage. All three stories are about the fact that Jesus is better. Jesus is better than these false gods. Jesus is better than these things I've held on to. Jesus is better than this life that I lived before. When the people came together, they burned it because the stuff was hurting them, but the, the second reason that they burned it is a better reason. They burned these things because they realized that Jesus was better than these things. Jesus was better than these things. And for many of these people, they had spent their entire lives looking at these things, thinking, I just need to get enough of this, and it's going to give me hope. I'm going to hold on to this book because my family has had this for generations and it's, it's always been an answer for us and so I'm going to hold on to it. It doesn't seem to be working for me, but if I try it a little harder, maybe I will. And they brought it together and they say they piled it up and they, they said it was 50,000 gold pieces or 50,000 drachmas and a drachma is basically a day's wage. Now as a preacher, what I do then is I take 50,000 days wages and what I went, because I got nothing else to do, is I went and multiplied that out to see what that looked like. I took $10 an hour and I, and I multiplied it by 40 hours a week and I, and I, and I did that and, and uh, over 50,000 uh, of those pieces and it came out to basically 150 years worth of wages at $10 an hour, which is $3.2 million worth of stuff piled up and burned right there in the middle. Now here's the cool part when you think about that. Imagine what it would be like right now if I took $3.2 million, piled it up right here, and started burning it. How many of you guys would freak out a little bit? Anybody? <laughs> right? Absolutely. I would. How many of us would be like, maybe if I slip around the back, I can stuff a couple in my pocket before it's all gone. Right? This is what we would do. But at that moment, $3.2 million did not matter to these people because Jesus was better. This is the reality that I'm trying to wrap my mind around when they encountered the true power of God, when they encountered the true power of God, they realized, I don't need this anymore. And so all of this stuff that everybody said was so valuable did not matter compared to Jesus. Jesus is better. And so they let it go. And nobody was reaching into the fire and grabbing it back out. Because Jesus is better. People repented because for the first time, they truly knew that Jesus is better. Repenting is a, such a cool thing. The idea of repenting is, is making a U-turn with your heart. You're going one direction, and you turn around, and you go a different way. And at this moment, for the first time, many of them, even the Christians, said, I'm done. Jesus is better. So here's my bottom line for you guys today. Super simple. Jesus is better. Jesus is better than all of these things that we have. And I'm speaking to you as, as, as a person who understands. I was talking to a friend of mine a couple weeks ago, and, and we were talking about addiction. 
Um, we were talking about addiction. I've talked to a few friends of mine about this. We have, we are, we, let's be honest, we are in a room full of people who are addicts. Right? Maybe we, we're, we may be addicted to, um, to, to alcohol. We may be addicted to, um, to sex. We may be addicted to porn. We may be addicted to, to affirmation. We may be addicted to gossip. We may be addicted to relationships. We may be addicted to politics. We're addicted to meth. We're addicted to anger. We're addicted to all of these things. And we think if I can just get enough of these things, then it's going to be okay. Or if I can get enough of this for today, then I will feel better today. And my friend was saying, because he had belt, dealt with addiction, he said, I haven't been able to start a moving away from this addiction until I came to understand that Jesus is better. When I came to understand that Jesus was better, it didn't make the urges go away. But it gave me a purpose because I found wholeness in something that this world could not give me. We live in a world that is angry, that is saying, if you just get enough anger then we're going to fix it. Maybe we're just not mad enough yet. I think that we live in a world that doesn't understand that Jesus is better. That we can't get rid of sin until we realize we don't need this sin anymore. What had happened in the church, what happened in the entire community of Ephesus was an entire people who said, I don't need this anymore. I just don't need it anymore. And I don't want to be flippant about this. I don't want to say that that's going to be easy. I have friends who were hooked on meth and are now clean. And will tell you, even, this to, even to this day, I'm still, when I think about it, it's like a girlfriend I know I shouldn't think about, but it still sounds good to think about. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but those same friends will say, but Jesus is better and I want him more. The addiction doesn't easily go away all the time. But we have to be delivered because if we're not, i got to have one more honest conversation with you. The guy that was possessed by this demon didn't set out to be that way. When we hold on to evil, it opens up evil into our hearts. I've seen it. I've heard stories, and I've heard about it. I, had, I listened to a, a man I like to listen to. His name is Mark Moore. He preaches in Phoenix. He used to be a Bible college professor, and I listened to him talk about some stuff that he taught. And one day, t- he said he was teaching at a CIY conference, which some of our students have gone to. And, and he was teaching at a CIY conference. He was the main speaker, and he said one night he was walking into this conference to speak. He was running late, and he walks up onto a group of people who are um, gathered around a girl and the paramedics are there. It's a bunch of kids and they're, they're praying over this girl and the paramedics are there and the youth minister walks over to, to Mark and he says, I don't know, we don't know what's going on, but she's stiff as a board. She can't say anything. She's not saying anything. She's just stiff and sitting here. And he says, okay, I got to go in. And he said, I'll come back. I want to see what's, I'll come back and pray with you if she's still here. He said, okay. So he went and he spoke at the conference. He walked back out and they were all gathered around. She was sitting there, and, and they were all um, laughing and praying and, and, and crying. It was an amazing thing. And the youth minister walked up to Mark, and he said, you will not believe what happened. I, we were gathered around here, and we were praying. And as we were praying, I had my eyes closed, and I was praying for her. And I saw in, in, my, in my mind, I saw this claw on top of her, holding her. And as we were praying... I, I saw a, a, a silver sword come through the sky and cut the cloth, and she went, <gasps> at that very moment. And as they started to talk to her afterwards, this is what she said. She had been at the conference. She hadn't been in the church. She had been at the conference, and she decided to go with some kids from her youth group, and as she was there, she sat there, and she took it all in, as we do when we go to these things, and we listen, and we take it in, and She said the last night she decided she was going to try and sing along with one of the songs. And as she opened her mouth to sing, her entire body went stiff. No sounds came out and she could not move. I'm not telling you this to freak you out, to scare you. But I can't be honest with Scripture and I can't be honest with the world that we see if we're not going to face the fact that there is darkness. And there are some of us in this very room that know the feeling of something holding us back that we can't even explain. But the amazing thing is Jesus is better. 
And this world needs to know that so that we don't get to that place. And we, if you are in this room and you're dealing with that type of darkness and you're dealing with, with that bond, ah, God, please break those chains today. Break those chains, Lord, so that we can be set free. And if you are not dealing with that and you have been playing a game with Jesus, then it's time for us as Christians to do something. My next step, do not forget who you are and why you're here. Don't forget why you're here. Because for those of us who are following Jesus, those of us who are following Jesus, we have been put here for a purpose. We have been put here for a purpose to be ambassadors for the kingdom and to set people free. God still sets people free. He still frees people of brokenness. He still frees people of darkness and bitterness. And it's time for us to stop playing this, this game and just, set, just go out and start setting people free. I saw this this last week. I got called to go preach at a little church in Gallup this last Sunday. And we're going to help that church out. We're going to send some people out there to preach. A little sister church of like 11 people. So I'm in there preaching to these 11 people. And we're, having, you know, we're getting to worship together. And we're preaching. And at the end, because God still sets people free, one of the elders stands up. The only elder at the church stands up and he says, Jim, just want you to come pray for me in front of everybody. So I go pray for this man, and as soon as I get done praying for him, there's a man who had been visiting the church for three weeks, about a 30-year-old guy. He comes up. His name is Rufus. Rufus didn't grow up in the church, and he says, I want to follow Jesus. I don't even know what that looks like, but I want to do that. And so Rufus and I, we talk about Jesus, and I share with him uh, Jesus saving us and Jesus dying for our sins and being set free. And, and, and then I talk to him about being baptized and dying to yourself and, and coming back new. And I share with him Romans 6. And, and, and then I turned to the guys and said, so can you guys baptize him next Sunday? And they're like, yeah, I guess we don't know how to fill up the baptistry. It's been a while. But God still sets people free. When we stop playing games and we start telling people, and so that's my last next step. Stop playing games, guys. It's time for all of us to stop playing games. I can easily put on a show. We all can. We can easily put on a show and, and, and hold on to our old things and, and, and have these secrets at home. You know what I'm talking about? We've got secrets at home. I don't do this. I'm just going to do it anyway, and you don't have to. I don't... How many of you have a secret at home that nobody here at this church knows about? And you're holding on to it. Thank you for being honest. Because like the people in Ephesus, until we let go of these secrets at home, our hearts are never going to be able to say without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is better. So what I want to offer you guys to do today is that chance. There's some ways that we're going to do that this morning. In a moment, we're going to take communion. And as we're doing that, I'm going to be in the back. If you would like to pray, I'll be back there. Brandon will be back there. We'll have some guys back there to pray with you. If you want to let go of some of these secrets at home, secrets at work. But there's another way as well that you can do that. Um, and I'm not telling you this to advertise. I'm telling you this because I believe in it. We've got tables out there to sign up for groups where you can confess and you can talk and you can be real. It's not always super, 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 super serious, but there are times when you can hear, he's got that too. She's doing that too. And until you're ready to, to confess that and to see that you're not alone in this, it's going to keep holding you down and it's going to keep feeling maybe literally like something is holding you back until you let go and confess that Jesus is better. So what we're going to offer a chance to do now is we're going to come down, we're going to take communion and as we're taking this communion, Jesus says that, uh, Paul tells us that we, we can't take communion unless we've examined ourselves. So I want you to examine yourself. Examine yourself and say, God, what am I holding back from you? What am I calling that greater than you? And as you come, confess it. Confess it. And if you need to be prayed over before you take communion, if you feel like you just need to let this go, I'll be back there. Some others will be back there. Confess it. Confess it these things and then come to Jesus and, and allow him to continue to clean you with the picture of his body broken on the cross in this bed, with, with the, the image of his blood poured out to wash our guilt away. Let Jesus have it and then get plugged in because Jesus is better. Our Lord and our God, I, I know that there is no other way but you. 
We, m- many of us in this room know that with our words, and we've, we've spoken it, and we want to believe it, but yet we're holding on to things. We're holding on to other things that are keeping us away from you. God, please let us be a church that doesn't play games with you. Let us be a church that knows why we're here. Because this world needs the healing that only you can provide. God, for every man and woman and young person in this room right now that is battling spiritual darkness, that is afraid and scared because they hear themselves in this story, I pray by the power of Jesus that you will set them free. I pray by the power of Jesus that you will set us free to be yours. Because Jesus is better. Have victory in us today, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's come forward now.